If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. What do we have here? This being. He's here as a phantom, so where is he actually? And he's covered in foul armor adorned in broken omen horns, as though trying to be something that he isn't. He asks the Tarnished if they've ever felt the curse, the reviled blessing, but as he sees it, this being before him is but a lamb, a stranger to defilement. These rotting corpse piles, is this the defilement that he's speaking of? Because, well, the Tarnished is no stranger to that. Violence, they've seen plenty of it in the lands between. Hmm. Well. The lift leading to the Altus Plateau is now free for their use. Exploring the roads leads to a decrepit church where Yura lays, bleeding. Seems that he found his Eleonora, and she did this to him. Yet, Yura still begs of her to cease her bloodlust, to no further stain her sword and flesh. And then he passes. Yura, too, has fallen to the lands between. Though he was not a friend, this is still a painful sight. Yura seemed to be a man of honor, a helper in dire moments past. Eleanor intends to do this to the Tarnished as well, however, and she invades the church to kill them. To honor the fallen Yura, the Tarnished takes down the maddened Eleonora, ending this sad tale never knowing the full extent of just what these two were. The main road leads to the outskirts of the capital, where war viciously raged for so long. Only once were the walls of the capital breached, though, long ago during Marka's war with the dragons. All else who tried to take the city after the shattering of the Elden Ring failed. There is still a demigod that keeps it safe, and he greets them in the fields. He appears to the body of a servant, left to stand in the middle of the road. The Tarnished knows them as Margaret the Fell Omen, but he provides no name here, simply attacking on sight before they breach the city. Strange that this creature would once again appear here, wishing to quell their wretched flame of ambition. Yet, when he falls, again he fades into glimmers of gold, like he did last time. Left behind to take the death is the body of that poor servant, so... Is this not truly the end of this being, and just who the hell are they that they can do this? Getting into the city requires surviving the forces still guarding it, and then fighting through a tree sentinel. But once they're in, the Tarnished can't help but wonder just what the hell these creatures were guarding because the city seems abandoned, save patrols. It's falling apart and left to decline. At a small sight of grace, Melina greets the Tarnished, to offer them her thanks as they've brought her close to where she wishes to be, the foot of the air tree. Neither of them know what awaits them, n nor what their ultimate goal may be. The only way to find out is to keep moving forward. But Melina will depart the Tarnished for now, to move ahead freely to find her purpose. This was inevitable, to be expected. She has her own goals and her own ambitions. What she does moving forward is no business of the Tarnished. But while she was done a favor in being brought here, that doesn't mean that the Tarnished is done with their travels. They're still far to go, like, through the city. Beauty means less and less the farther they travel. What's the point in observing how lovely something is if it's fetid on the inside? In one of the buildings, they find a corpse tied to a chair, and upon it is something new, a seedbed curse. Further investigation reveals that it's the work of someone called the Dung Eater. They grow them in corpses, defile them with a curse that prevents their soul from returning to the air tree, a pox in the lands between, to be denied a proper death. Well, this is just confusing and terrifying that something exists that could do this. The seedbed curse is covered in small omen horns. There are a few leads that they could follow with that, but for now, they'll wait on pursuing it. If they should spot more of these seedbeds, then they will collect them. Lendell's soldiers still walk these broken streets amongst those lowly in the city who have not yet perished, air tree avatars and the corpse of a great dragon. Fia once worked her craft here, and the original round table hold still carries on in the city, though abandoned and in decline. Up the roofs of the air tree itself and higher into the city, oracle envoys bellow their instruments, beckoning forth a new era, and guardians of the air tree still stand prepared to stop anything that might seek to harm it. They're not all that guards the way forth. A golden shade still remains, not here in body, but still a protector, is Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. Before his exodus to the Badlands long ago, he was the husband of Merica, father to Godwin the Golden and to the Omen twins Moog and Morgoth. When he fought his last great foe in the Lands Between, he lost all purpose and began to fall from grace. Merica sent him and his followers away from the Lands Between to continue their battles. Like Loretta at the Caria Manor, the spirit remains as a guardian over the path forward. Not fully the power of the once greatest warrior of the Lands, but still a mighty foe to keep safe the way ahead but this visage of Godfrey will not impede the Tarnished, at least not for long. 
But atop the city, beyond the bedchambers of the queen, at the air tree itself is the one who truly resides over the desolate Lindell. When his mother vanished and war came to the land, he stepped in to see the throne kept safe from those that he sees as willful traitors, those who once sat in this court and held seats of honor. He was made known as Margot, but now the Tarnish knows them for who they truly are, Morgoth, the other Omen twin, brother of Moog, yet he's quite different from the Bloodlord. Morgoth, the Omen King, speaks with disdain towards the dishonorable deeds of others and unsheathes his weapon properly now, ready to truly face this Tarnished in combat. His brother found solace and purpose in the arms of another god, the Mother of Truth, who gifted Moog terrible blood magics, but Morgoth stayed true to the way of the Golden Order and fights with Grand Holy Light. Much like his brother, if he had only been trained and guided as their brother Godwin the Golden had been, he truly would have been mighty to behold. The Omen Twins would have been seen as blessings in ancient times, yet their mother's faith in the greater will and all things pure and golden denied them anything but the squalor of the sewers. Merica wasted away her eldest twins. She discarded them, she threw them away to her own detriment. He sees himself as filth and a curse, unworthy of approaching this throne. Yet still, he defends it. It feels a terrible thing to kill Morgoth, but he made his choices. He stands in opposition. The Omen King falls at the base of the air tree, never able to reach his mother, always outside the grace of the greater will. Before he passes from his wretched life, Morgoth briefly speaks to the Tarnished, telling them that the air tree has forsaken them all. None may approach it. None may claim the title of Elden Lord. His last words are that of his own perceived failures. And he was speaking truth. The air tree is fully closed off by thicket, unburnable and uncuttable. Sitting beside a small site of grace, Melina approaches again. She knows the tale of a war that happened ages ago between Merica's blossoming golden order and the giants of the north. A great cauldron rests there, holding a small flame that can burn the tree. Take her there, and she will burn the tree with that flame. Very well. One more journey to take, yet a long ways to go. But first, to the northwest. The Tarnished has heard tale of a Mount Gelmer near the Altus Plateau, where once the fiercest battles were held during the Great War between Merica's offspring. It was the son of Rinala and Radigan, the one called Rikard, that led the forces of Mount Gelmer, based within the stronghold called Volcano Manor. Rikard repelled all invading forces, never seeking to move out of the region, but kept it for himself. He studied the hex magics of the locals and something within the mountain, a supposed god-devouring serpent. Volcano Manor is more like a walled-in city than an actual manor, and approaching on foot is a, a very hazardous affair. Immediately within the main hall of the manor is a woman named Kenneth, the consort of Rikard. She asks if they've ever harbored doubts about the Greater Will. This is a bit like Ronnie's tactic of manipulation but they're willing to hear the woman out. And the Tarnished really carries a lot of the same sentiments of Tanith. She's right to the point. So sure, the Tarnished will join this volcano manor and see what they have to offer. What Tanith asks for in return for membership is an agreement to carry out some assassinations. And it's the affair of the individual Tarnished to decide whether this is a path that they wish to pursue. There are certainly benefits to being this woman's hitman, like getting to spend more quality time with the leech patches. Beyond the uneasy security of the manor is the heart of Mount Gilmer, a small city once laid here atop the mountain. The resident studied ancient hex magics in a lure to Rikard, and he vanished here after the shattering. He never departed the mountain, yet still his ever-loyal armies fought viciously in his name. It stands to reason that Rikard himself is still somewhere here. Something caused lava to surge, destroying the settlement that lay within. It was clearly once a place of life and activity, now left to fall into the ocean of the mountain but remnants of what once was tell of a grisly end beyond ascending magma. The battles that waged outside were terrible, countless people died in the mountain. But within Volcano Manor, there are torture devices, instruments of inquisition, and living creatures meant to inflict suffering on others. Other great beings have made their home here as well that stand in defiance of other gods that live in service to the Gloam-Eyed Queen. She herself was once an Empyrean who wielded the power of destined death, a rival and a threat to Merica. According to the fables, it was from she that Merica and her shadow Malaketh took destined death, and once they had sealed away destined death, the gloam eyed queen disappeared, and immortality came to the demigods of the lands between. Godskin apostles still roam the lands, intent on snuffing out other powers and their servants, that is, if you believe the tales of old. 
Deep in the heart of the mountain are answers to the kind of man that Rygird proved to be. The great god-devouring serpent of local legend wriggles and writhes in a great hollow, filled with the corpses of those brought to be consumed. Though if the stories are to be believed, then Rygird should be here someplace. He's nowhere to be found, though, as the god-devouring serpent strikes out against the invading Tarnished. Though there are other paths to take in combat against this terrible amalgamation, the Tarnished will fight with blades and axe. Humanoid appendages line the body of the snake, so there's more than meets the eye coiled up in that thing. It uses the forces of the mountain itself as an attack, draining molten lava around itself as a defense mechanism. And with weapons not meant to kill the god devourer, it makes for a titanic fight of patience and timing. But flaying the skin of the serpent and taking its life does not mean the end for what's within. For Rikard, a demigod, was consumed and became one with the serpent. Rikard will not fall so easily. He takes control of this vessel, displaying all the cruelty he indulged in when he took this form long ago. His many victims squirm about the snake's body, and along his very weapon, unsheathed from within the maw of the dead serpent. This fight begins anew, but with Rikard the Lord of Blasphemy at the helm. He cleaves his great weapon across the field, and using the limbs of those consumed by the snake, he moves with a disturbing ease for something his size. Rikard is the brother of the fallen General Radon and the brother of Lunar Witch Rani. Long ago, during the Night of the Black Knives, he counseled and aided his little sister in her task. Though how deeply involved he was isn't known. Everything is left to speculative gambits between the two. Rikard's fall is not the death of the Lord of Blasphemy. He says that no one will hold him captive, that serpents never die. Back in the main part of the manor, Tanith seems a bit startled at Rikard's defeat. As his longtime consort, this has to be hard news for her to accept, but she knows that he is immortal and that one day he will return, and this defeat will make him stronger in time. She holds no ill will towards the Tarnished for doing this. In fact, she tells them that she will miss these encounters. Actually, no one within Volcano Manor harbors poor feelings towards the Tarnished for their actions. It's the strong who take, it's always been that way. They will all be better for it in the future. Though, returning to the mountain where Rikard was slain, something is taking place that rather defies explanation. Tanith has found Rikard's carcass, and she's consuming it, literally eating it. So that he might find purchase within her, she says, make her part of his family as a serpent so that they might be god devourers together one day. Well, this is really still not the weirdest thing they've seen. Just, just gonna let this one take its course. After the death of Morgoth, the young woman Melina had given the Tarnished a key to a lift outside the city, and she marked it on their map to give them guidance on where to go. This leads them across the city ramparts to another lift, which takes them down to the base of the North Mountains, where they must tread through the fog and dangers to reach a grand lift that they seek. Atop it is a lonely place, the first steps to the former land of the giants. Only one of them remains now, forever cursed by Merica to guard their flame that can burn the air tree. It's a horror to find here, Yura. But Yura died back in the Altus Plateau. The Tarnished watched him take his last breath. Something else is within Yura's body. They call themselves Shabriri. This being is linked to that girl Hayata, the one who ate the Shabriri grape so that she might see a distant light. She said that she would be a finger maiden because of it. Shabriri tells them that should they use the Flame of the Cauldron, it will cost Melina's life, killing her to become the Elden Lord. Yes, it's a terrible thing. But the Tarnished respects Melina's intelligence and determination enough to understand that she can make her own choices. Shabriri's attempts at manipulation really don't work. But he asks something interesting. What if they burned their own flesh instead? Attain lordship another way. He says that should they be interested, to delve into the systems beneath the capital city, where Moog and Morgoth once called home. Sink into its deepest pits and find the Three Fingers and the Flame of Frenzy. To have the Flame of Frenzy means that they themselves can burn the tree. Melina herself is, is not a factor in this equation, at least not to this tarnished. She can make her own choices, and she seems to be allied with the will of Merica and the Greater Will. She exists to restore order to this world, to bring about a new Elden Lord. And this is something for them to contemplate. After all they've seen, is that what the Tarnished wants? All the cruelty of the Golden Order and the Kin of Merica, is that what the next age should be? A rebirth and a return to that cycle? There is far yet to go, so they will keep this in mind. Shabriri himself, or itself, whatever they are, can go pound sand for all they care. But the prospect that he presents, it's interesting enough. Whilst this place seems to be another of decline and decay, it once was not so. 
It's the same story as everywhere else in the lands between. Once there were settlements, outposts, castles, but after America wrought her will, it all went to hell. To the north is a place called Castle Sol, where Commander Nile still rules. He once traded his valuable prosthetic leg for the release of defeated knights when the war was waging. Those men abandoned all other allegiances and served him faithfully for many years. But what he guards is too great a mystery to ignore, and it turns out to be the other half of another Great Lift medallion. And these seem to be popping up left and right, and actually, taking a closer look, the Tardish had randomly found the other half of this one in Liurnia, at the village of the Albanarex. An old man had it on him, and because they shared a mutual acquaintance, he'd given them the matching half to this thing. So, it says it's to the Halic Tree, and that's another familiar name. It had something to do with Mikala, that Empyrean thing in the cocoon that Moog was guarding. Must be where he was from. There's also been mention of his sister, Melania, a great warrior who had fought General Radon. Maybe she's there right now, too. Definitely worth looking into. Maybe the Halic Tree is a nice place to be. Well, anyways, that's another path forward to explore, but for now, there's still business to conduct on this part of the mountain. Other Tarnished still roam about these parts. There's some business of the Volcano Manor that can be conducted, and run in with a demon swordsman that grew tired of the absurdities of the world, and he renounced it all. Then the Great One himself, the last fire giant. His people once raged a great war against Merica and her Golden Order. They were not the instigators, though. They were targeted because of the threat that they held against the Erd Tree. Their flame could burn it to the ground. After she had destroyed them, Merica found that flame in their forge would never die, so she cursed the final being to act as its guardian. So for untold ages, he did. Alone on the mountaintop, cursed to never abandon his duty. He keeps all approachers away from the cauldron. He must die for the tarnish to proceed on. Upon his body is the eye of the nameless god that his kind served, another outer god amongst many. Sacrificing part of his broken body, the giant is able to call upon them again and is blessed with greater strength. But even the strength of its god cannot stop the assault of the tarnished. The last of the fire giants dies that day upon the mountain. This relic of a long past age finally allowed to die, hopefully to find some place new in the world after, hopefully able to be with his people once again. Now could be the time to approach the cauldron, burn the tree, presumably approach the Elden Ring, usurp the mantle of Elden Lord. But you know, too many things are yet unknown, and the Tarnished has decided that appeasing the greater will is not what they desire. There's no rush, so destiny can wait. Roaming about the Altus Plateau, the Tarnished comes across a familiar face. It's brother Corin from Round Table Hold. When he said that he would be leaving the hold, the Tarnish kind of thought that that would be the last time they'd ever see him, but he's still out here kicking, looking for a guy called Gold Mask. Corrin thinks that he's somewhere close, and gosh, this area is so dangerous. To save Corrin from having to look around the nooks and crannies of this hellscape, the Tarnished goes to search for Gold Mask instead. Corrin doesn't even have shoes on. What's he going to do against a dog raptor? Well, on the other side of a big broken bridge, the Tarnished finds something. At first, it looked like a statue of a really skinny, weird-looking naked man pointing at the sun, but getting closer, it's actually a really skinny, weird-looking naked man pointing at a tree. He doesn't say anything, he just mouth breathes. He does have a gold mask on his face, though, so this must be gold mask. Relaying this back to Brother Corrin proves this theory correct, and it's fiercely exciting for him, which in turn kind of gets the Tarnished excited, too. Happiness isn't a common thing around here, and Corrin's response gets them kind of invested in this whole mystery. He goes to find Gold Mask, and soon after, the Tarnished follows to see what they're up to. Brother Corrin gets right to work with the unspeaking Gold Mask, deciphering his discoveries by studying the slightest movements of his fingers. Gold Mask seems fine with his presence, or perhaps unconcerned, and Corrin is beyond content performing these tasks. It will take some time for him to get the basics, but he's thrilled to have the chance at it. After some exploring of the capital, looking for a way into the sewers, they come across the duo again this time much closer to the Erd Tree. Based on Corrin's distressed speech, it seems that Gold Mask is contemplating something about Radigan, who the Tarnished only really knows in name. He was the former husband of Queen Renala. He abandoned her to marry Queen Merica. I mean, in the Tarnished's book, he's kind of an asshole, but what's Gold Mask all worked up over? Corrin has learned to read bits of what Gold Mask is relaying, but he stopped his finger movements, really caught up on something about Radigan. He can't figure it out and Corrin is distressed over his ceased dictation. He says that the Golden Order is built upon the belief that Merica is the one true god. Yet Radigan's name appeared in Goldmask's discoveries, but why Radigan? What secret did they hold? 
The only physical representation the Tarnished has seen of Radigan was a statue of him in the city, but they only saw it from afar and they really paid it no mind. Well, it's not too far away, they could make a run there no problem. On the approach, a cleared note is laid out before the statue. Who left it is a complete mystery, but it says, Regression alone reveals secrets. Well, they have an incantation called Law of Regression. They've never been one for spellcasting, but sure, why not? And what it reveals is that, well, the statue is actually one of Merica. And there's a new note that says, Radigan is Merica. Oh, okay. Well, that's potentially problematic in ways that make one question how they did butt stuff to make children. But I mean, do, do gods reproduce like normies do? Or do they just, you know, queef their children into existence? You know what? This is a matter better suited for gold mask. So... In Existential Dread, the Tarnished returns to the unspeaking fellow, who's actually started to grow on them a bit as a bud. In the very least, he seems pretty neat. Corrin is still in crisis mode, trying to determine why Goldmask won't move, so the Tarnished sidles up and just sort of whispers to Goldmask that, well, hey, Radigan is Merica. He doesn't say anything, he doesn't react, at least not from what the Tarnished can see. But Corrin says that he is moving again, his fingers are in motion once more. He's mighty grateful for it. It's such a relief to see Goldmask moving again. But the whole Merica Radigan thing is just as confusing for Corrin as it is the Tarnished. Well, there are other things to see too for now, so the Tarnished will just leave these two be for a while. They couldn't find a way under the city to find that weird three finger thing that Shabriri mentioned. And when loneliness really starts to settle in, the Tarnished can't help but remember Blythe. After they defeated General Radon, he said that he would meet them where that massive star impacted. And that was a while ago. So they better go check their buddy down, see how he's doing, what adventures he's gotten himself into. The falling star made a clear impact in Mistwood. It tore straight through the ground, opening up a makeshift path of sorts back into the underground. Carefully platforming down takes the Tarnished into Nokran, the internal city, the precise place that Blythe was seeking out on behalf of Ronnie. Though what specifically they're looking for isn't really clear, the Tarnished didn't really think about asking about it. They were just counting on Blythe to fill in the gaps as they went. Except, well, Blythe is nowhere to be seen. He wasn't on the surface waiting for them, and he's definitely not down here. Gosh, that all felt like so long ago. Where did Blythe move on to? Were they just too slow in getting down here? It takes some time to get to the main section of the city. This hollowed out underground is truly massive. Nokran is a wholly built-out city where once an ancient people thrived. The legend says that they committed some sort of a high treason, leading to the downfall of the city. There are giants down here, sitting in places of honor in public squares. So that high treason probably involved serving a god that wasn't the greater will, or acting in allegiance towards something that wasn't the Golden Order. Beneath the throne of one of these giants is a chest containing a Finger Slayer blade. But wait, hold on. Ronnie was an Empyrean, in her original body at least. Presumably she's still trying to defy her own fate, which means well, she does have her own two fingers still at her service, binding her to the Greater Will, and this, at least if the name is accurate, this blade could kill a finger. Okay. So maybe... Huh. Okay. Kinda hard for them to piece it all together. Ronnie wanted something from Nokran. This seems like something she would want, and Blythe is nowhere to be seen, so maybe they'll take it back to Ronnie, see what she has to say. There's still quite a lot of Nokran to see, but for now, the Tarnish decides to run this blade back to Ronnie to see if she knows what happened to their friend. Maybe Blythe went back to the tower already. And, well, sadly, he hasn't returned, and Ronnie acknowledges that it was the Tarnish that brought this blade, not Blythe. Ronnie says that this is the final piece she needs, but to what end still isn't clear. She says she's to undertake a journey down a dark path only she can tread, but where is Blythe? Ronnie gives them a carrion inverted statue. It's the key to finding her discarded flesh, her body that bears the curse mark from the Rune of Death. Rogier had spoken of that brand before everything had fallen apart, but it's a key to something. Well, the only part of Liurnia that's been left untouched was a sprawling tower across a bridge attached to the carrion study hall. The Tarnish had climbed it to the top, but they'd found no way across it. Maybe one more trip back to see if they missed a door. And well, it's not a door, but in the study hall, there was a pedestal missing something. And placing that statue on it causes the entire tower to flip upside down. How sneaky of the Academy to have such a thing built. 
Admittedly, the Tarnish hadn't even noticed during their first climb that this tower had an inverse pathing about it. Logistically, how does this thing even work? Maybe it's the Tarnish that's just walking on the ceiling now somehow. It does take some steady platforming to a s d descend the inverted tower to an elevator that takes them down or up, one of the two. But once there, they do find the door that they couldn't locate before, and it takes them to that bridge before the sprawling tower. Ascending the Divine Tower of Liurnia takes the Tarnished to Ronnie's grisly choice, her corpse, and upon it, the curse mark. The body is decaying, completely devoid of life's remnants, save a few patches of red hair. They now have the curse mark, but their reasons for getting it at this point, they've almost forgotten why it's been so long. Why were they so keen on getting this? Venturing around Nokran takes the Tarnished high and low. In their search, they find another Tarnished. He's without armor, with a white blanket across his lap, and he seems to be crying or in distress. And he's interested in Dee's armor. When he receives it, he says, Dari, but that's all. This poor creature, how did he get down here, and why is he so distraught? He won't respond anymore, so all the Tarnished can do is move on and hope for the best for him. Nearby, just up a stairs, leads to the lair of duo valiant gargoyles, nasty bits of works, but a jolly cooperator is one called D, Beholder of Death. Is that the young man that was so broken? The tarnished D was the hunter of the dead, so are these two related? Do, do they know that the other D has died, killed by the woman Fia at the Round Table Hold? After the fight, a strange coffin appears at the waterfall in the arena, and the tarnished can lay in it, it's like a taxi of sorts. It whisks them away from this part of the underground, climbing a strange line of runes and words to defy gravity. It takes them to the deep root depths, to the literal roots of the air tree. And if the stories they've heard during their journeys are to be believed, at the roots should lie the corpse of a demigod. Bits of the old world are scattered at the base of the tree. Looks like there were some beautiful buildings here once, a small community to tend to those pursuing a pilgrimage here. Up the roots leads to an opening in the roots where the body of Godwin the Golden lies intertwined. His spirit is not here, Godwin is dead, yet his body, still living, was brought here and embedded into the tree by those loyal to him, in hopes that the power of the air tree would restore him to life. But it was impossible. The plot hatched by the Lunar Princess Rani could not be undone. The rune of death killed Godwin's spirit, so that she could use the other half of the rune to kill her own Empyrean body a step in releasing herself from the greater will, freeing herself from the call of destiny. Approaching garners the attention and hostility of spirits loyal to the deathbed companion, Fia. She should be around here someplace, and of course, she would have her own protectors to call upon. There are a great number of them summoned, including the spirit of their friend, Rogier. So, Rogier has died then. He died while the Tarnished was away. They couldn't even be there to comfort Rogier when he passed. He died alone in the round table hold, and his spirit is fighting for that soul leech. When all her supposed champions are ended, then finally, Fia herself. As a deathbed companion, she absorbed the life of the living, and placed it into the bodies of the dead, bringing them back to a form of second life. She wishes to do this for Godwin, to birth him anew using the life source that she took from others within round table hold. She boldly asks if the Tarnished intends to deny them their ways, like the brutes of the Golden Order, not seeing the terrible things that she's done to other Tarnished, what terrible things she intends to do with the corpse of a demigod. She's going to use Godwin's body to fulfill her own agenda. Fia is more like Moog than Rogier, Blythe, or Dee. Rather than strike her down, the Tarnished decides to see this through, as they will all potential usurpers to understand fully why they do the things they do, their intentions, their reasonings. Fia says she needs the other half of the hollow brand, the curse mark the Tarnished got from Ronnie's body. This is a steep ask, it's one they need to consider. If they did give it to Fia, it could be a catastrophe. She could birth a new demigod that seeps on death. The whole of the lands between could be ravaged by Deathroot. Everyone would be subjected to it, and this soulless being she births would be uncontrollable or completely under her control. But if they did give it to her, maybe they could end the madness before it truly was born. Stop death at its roots. It's such a gamble. But one the Tarnished will take. After meditating on it for a while, they return to Fia, and they give her the curse mark. What a thrill for her, that she can give Godwin undeath, create the Prince of Death. 
She will begin immediately, providing Godwin his second illustrious life, as she puts it. One more embrace for the road, and a request to leave be those who live in death, become the Elden Lord and favor them. Soon after, Fia falls into a slumber beside Godwin's corpse. By touching her, the Tarnished is able to enter the deathbed dream that she is witnessing. And what resides within the deathbed dream is the old friend of Godwin, Fortisax. In life, they met as combatants when Merica waged war against the dragons. Fortisax and Godwin had a mighty battle against one another and became friends in the end. When Godwin was slain, Fortisax did everything he could to stop death from taking his friend and went to the roots of the air tree where his body was entombed to try and save him from this fate. But in the end, Fortisax was corrupted by the death root around Godwin and changed into a lich dragon. Here, in the dreams of the deathbed, Fortisax rampages on, unable to save Godwin, himself becoming another victim of Ronnie's scheme. Killing the lich dragon Fortisax brings this dream to an end. And so too does it end the life of Fia. She will never awaken from that slumber. Over her body rests the mending rune of the Death Prince, the entirety of the Mark of the Centipede. What the Tarnished will do with it is unclear, at least for now. But with this in their possession, perhaps this mad rebirth will stop. Fia's plans will halt with her death. Those who live in death will not overtake this land. Good riddance to them. A sentiment much shared by the one wearing Dee's old armor. This must be the young man the Tarnished found in Nokrin that was blathering to himself. He's donned Dee's armor and revels in having run his sword through Fia's corpse. He's quite intent on claiming credit for all of this and rejoices in Fia's death, all in the name of the Golden Order. This is not the Tarnished's D, no, this is his brother, half mad from previously encountering Godwin's body long ago. This must be cathartic for him. One can't help but wonder if he knew that Fia killed his twin brother. This, this isn't the business of the Tarnished. They'll let this raving madman enjoy whatever victory he perceives this to be. There are other things to attend to, namely, their friend Blythe. Where has he gone to? E.G. has nothing to say in regards to where Blythe is, but he does have insights on where Ronnie may have scampered off to. She told him that she was taking a path via Rena's Rise, a place that was previously closed off to the Tarnished, but it's worth looking into now. E.G. knows that his time in service to Ronnie is ending. He's been serving her for as long as he can remember, but he's excited for her future. Going back to the towers, they find Rena's Rise, and it's finally open to approach. Within is pretty simple, some attire to be found, it's kinda cozy. Atop is a portal, the Tarnished has seen these before. There's no way to tell where it leads, except to just enter it. And this one leads to the underground, to the Ansel River Main. What was Ronnie doing here, though? In an opened coffin is a weird small miniature Ronnie doll. A weapon or a piece of armor would befit this place, but a doll? Well, the Tarnished sits next to a small side of Grace and talks to the doll. About anything, about everything, asking questions, just passing the time. Until the doll has had quite enough and speaks up. Seems Ronnie can hear everything they've been saying and finds their persistence to be irritating. Since they've seen through her disguise and caused such irritation, she asks that they make it up to her by eliminating the baleful shadow that haunts this area. Terribly demanding, but since the Tarnished promised themselves that they would see every opportunity through, they agree to it and start hunting this shadow thing. And not far away, it's the form of Blythe. Blythe attacks. Ronnie tells the shadow to relay to the two fingers that she is coming for them to rend their flesh. It, this doesn't really make any sense. Why would Blythe do this? Or this must just be the image of Blythe. It's not actually their friend. What would drive the real Blythe to do something like this? He wouldn't. He just wouldn't harm them. So the Tarnished brings down this shadow, as Ronnie requested, and she thanks them for the hard-fought win. Now she can stand before them, whoever that is, and then she says goodbye, with a request to tell Eiji and Blythe that she loves them. And she leaves the Tarnished an old palace key. It's starting to feel ominous, isn't it? The Tarnished continues their ventures through the lakes and beds of rot in this underground, looking for more clues as to what Ronnie is up to and contemplating this discarded palace key. This must relate back to Ronnie's home. The palace would probably be the academy, but they fully cleared the academy. The only mystery left there would be the chest that rests next to the semi-slumbering Queen Ronala. Even if that's not the answer, it's a good place to start looking. The Tarnished encounters a wildly beautiful monstrosity at the end of this underground. They are called Estelle, natural born of the Void. And how remarkably different they are, a creature from the Void. But how on earth did they get down here? 
What is it doing in the rotting undergrounds of the land between? Estelle is described as a malformed star, born in the flightless void far away, who once destroyed an eternal city and took away their sky. Estelle has been here untold ages. It is vicious and ethereal, but it's not of this world. Estelle does not belong here in this sickly underground, and acts as an ill omen and threat to life. A way up is ahead, but before proceeding, the Tarnished travels back via a side of grace to where Queen Renala rests. And that discarded key that Ronnie left behind does indeed open the chest, and within is a ring. The Dark Moon Ring. Upon it is an inscription. Whoever thou mayest be, take not the ring from this place. The solitude beyond the night is better mine alone. This was meant to be given to Ronnie's chosen consort when she rose to become a ruler. To think, if the Empyreans went to war to decide who would succeed Merica, the Lunar Witch Rani versus the forces of Mikala, what a doomsday that would have been. Rani almost certainly would have lost to the twins of the Halic Tree. Destruction was really inevitable, wasn't it? Seems a useless task to heal these lands after all that they've seen. But again, the Tarnished promise to see things through to their end, so they go back to where Estelle was killed and ride the lift up. And they find themselves at the Moonlight Altar guarded by that dragon, Adula, the same one that they fought before Ronnie's rise some time ago. The beast remains for the entirety of the fight this time, proving to be a difficult foe even now. There's something in that church that it's safekeeping, and the Tarnished intends to discover exactly what that is. Bringing down this great glintstone dragon gives the Tarnished passage to whatever they might seek out on this cliff. What they find within that church is a crater, like something crashed here long ago, and gods, it's dark. A misstep could spell disaster, but they make it down in one piece and walk the long, dark corridor of this unknown. At the end is the massacred remains of a two-finger, and before it, the discarded husk of Ronnie's doll body. She did it. She rid herself of her Empyrean body, found someone to act as her errand boy in obtaining the Finger Slayer, and killed her own two-finger. She's truly free from the greater will. Such terrible things were done to so many, such a high cost for her own benefit, but she never had to pay for those tragedies. If things proceed as she wishes, then she'll have won. She'll have won everything. Placing the ring upon the doll's body summons Ronnie herself back. The one who she believes will enact her will, become her lord, and bring about her desired future is here. And she accepts them. She will go to the night sky to find her order. When the Tarnished becomes the new Elden Lord, then she will return. And now begins the darkest part of this tale. The Tarnished knows not what awaits them, but it's putrid, it's heartbreak, it's betrayal, it's the foul truth of conceited gods. Where next they go will be the diseased north, and then the pits beneath the city, where the omens await, where their belief in any goodness remaining in these lands will fade into the darkness.